Hello everyone and welcome back to Industry Perspectives. I'm your host Ainsley Bowden and today I'm speaking with Dr. Rachel Cohert, who is the Research Director at TakeThis.org. Now Rachel's work focuses on digital games and therefore we get into topics such as the stigmas associated with gaming, toxicity towards women, and general mental health awareness around gaming, watching video games, Twitch, etc. We also of course have to tackle what the best Final Fantasy is of all time. Let's get to it. All right, and we are live with the latest industry perspectives chat with Dr. Rachel Cohort from TakeThis.org. How are you doing? Hi, I'm doing great. How are you doing? Very well, very well. Thank you for coming on. I uh, I've been looking forward to this. I know we scheduled it a few weeks ago, um, but I know I know we'll get into more details. But very, uh, you know, very interested in the work that Take This does, uh, especially yourself, obviously, with you dealing with the kind of video game, you know, focus of it, which is what we cover, obviously. So yeah, yeah. I'm excited to chat. <laughs> so uh as i always do on this though uh because a lot of our audience doesn't know the guests you know intimately mm -hmm. so uh where i wanted to start is you know i find your background obviously incredibly interesting and there's a lot to cover which we'll go over um but just going back like in your life um ha have video games played a prominent role in your life since you were young or is this something more recent for you that's kind of you know been a passion Definitely. Since I was young, I okay. very clearly remember getting Super Mario Brothers and nice. I had an older brother, so I had to watch him play um, <laughs> at first. And then growing up, um, I kind of my brother kind of brought him into the house and I did kind of follow his footsteps at first. And then it was something that we enjoyed together. And my entire all the way until I had kids, um, I played a whole lot of video games and then and then sleep took priority. And now I play less. But yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I get it. I completely understand. And it's funny, you know, right out of the gate, you mentioned something that, something that you had to watch him play because, you know, if you're like me who grew up in the 80s, right, and, and you had video games as kids, it really uh, kind of was that way. It was like the boys might have yeah. played Nintendo and the girls were supposed to go do something else. And uh, yeah, it's and weird yeah. to think about now, isn't it? It is. And it was very much, there was a lot of one player games. I remember when we got uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles arcade yeah. edition for Christmas and you could play with two turtles at the same time. <laughs> it was like groundbreaking in my house. Yeah. Yeah. I can imagine. I can imagine. <laughs> so, um, let, let's talk about kind of uh, your, I don't want to talk about your education per se, but what led you to this? So uh, obviously you have, well, not obviously, but you have PhD in psychology um, and you are yes. the research director at takethis.org. Um, yes. But your focus is primarily, and please keep me honest here, but your focus is primarily <laughs> on digital games and gaming yes. and some of, you know, many different varieties of impact that gaming can have around mental health, uh, you know, and, and everything that goes along with that. Is that right? That is correct. It's, it was kind of, um, it wasn't a straight shot, my journey. I, <laughs> I knew I wanted to study psychology. Sorry, yelling at my children, be quiet. Um, I knew I wanted to study psychology and with psychology, you really need a uh, graduate degree to do anything really actually in psychology. Sure. So I went to get my master's to become a therapist. Okay. And my first day of my master's program, I thought, oh, I do not have the disposition to be a therapist. <laughs> um, and that's when I, I, I stuck with the program. I had moved to California. I went to Santa Clara University for my master's. And, okay. Um, as I progressed through the program, I really discovered a love for research. And I thought if I continue with this program, it will make me a better researcher because I will then have the perspective of what clinicians need and what a clinician's perspective is. Um, and it, and I think it has really informed a lot of the work that I do. So that's kind of like the mental health base that I had. I and from yeah. there, I went and got a PhD. Okay, interesting. And so what then on that journey or that path kind of did you work in other fields or, or other areas before you found Take This and kind of got down the, the gaming path per se? Uh, I was always on the gaming path. Um, okay. So in my master's program, you have to do therapy, obviously, because it was training <laughs> yes. to be a therapist. And <laughs> I was seeing multiple, multiple parents um, with concerns about their children playing World of Warcraft. So this was 2008, <laughs> so like okay. heights, right? Yeah. Now, 
full disclosure, I was playing so much World of Warcraft at the time. <laughs> so after about the third set of parents, I was like, oh man, like, do I need to be worried? There seems to be a lot of concern here. Yeah. Uh, but game studies, game studies research wasn't really a thing. There was like two papers at a Stanford and that was it. Right. Um, so I pivoted to research doing game studies research for my PhD. I did a game studies postdoc um, at the University of Münster. And then would take this, it more came kind of full circle back to mental health. So with my PhD and with my postdoc, I focus mostly on the social impact of games. Uh, and then my work at Take This has taken me back to kind of the bigger perspective about psychological, social, physical, kind of the holistic uh, look at the impact of games. Wow. Yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> that's impressive. Um, so <laughs> yeah, uh, that's, yeah. Don't have another word. It's impressive. <laughs> oh, <you're so> sweet. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. It's, it's been a journey. It's been, you know, higher education. It's, it's a journey. Yes. Yes. In fact, uh, no, no, no joke. Actually, my, my wife just finished her, she finishes her bachelor's uh, next month. Uh, ah, congrats. One that couldn't do it when she was younger, had kids early and now mm -hmm. revisited it, but she's uh, already signed up for a master's degree in psychology and she really yeah. likes helping children. Um, oh, cool. And so, you know, it's, it's, I told her I was speaking to you today in your background mm -hmm. and she just found it, you know, very interesting as well. So um, it's kind of neat to, yeah. to see the, you know, the whole journey there because I, I realize it's a tremendous amount of work. Um, oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's a tremendous amount of work and time and money. And, yes. Um, all worth it. I, I definitely, I feel like you have the passion for higher education. Those are the, you have to have the passion. Yes. Or, or yeah, it's not worth <laughs> so when did you find yourself and I didn't I didn't see this in kind of looking at things uh, previously but how long have you been with Take This? Then? I've been with Take This for 2 years. Okay. Um been a fan for longer. It actually I was invited to speak on a panel by the clinical director of Take This a couple years ago. And I had known of the organization and known of the work that they did, but I'd never met anybody um, in the organization and when I met him, we clicked really early on. Okay. And I remember being like, let's go get a coffee. And I was like, you need a research director. And he was like, yeah, you know, we're starting to do more research. And I was like, you need <laughs> a research director. And I kind of just manhandled my way um, in there. And now here I am. That's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> So uh, it's good to good to hear that that uh, worked out. <laughs> guess a lot of times, really <laughs> no, I know. I mean, I guess I, I was fortunate that they were already going in that direction. Sure. And when my postdoc ended, I had children. We were talking about children earlier. I had my children later in life. I did all the education first. Sure. Um, so it was like right place, right time, kind of thing. That's awesome. That's awesome. So uh, outside of take this, uh, I was kind of fascinated to read that uh, you've also published uh, a few books um along well you've published a lot of things but a couple things i wanted to touch on is um yeah you have um most recently you have a well not most recently but a parent's guide to video games which you published a few years ago right and uh yes. that's titled the essential guide to understanding how video games impact your child's physical social and psychological well-being um which again uh, I keep using the word fascinating um but how did, how was the response to that because as you kind of commented on uh, just a bit ago, you know, it, it's really only recently as video games have really grown and become this kind of, you know, uh, a gigantic industry and blooming industry globally that they are now that a lot of these things are really starting to be studied and analyzed and all this. So, you yes. know, it's kind of like you're you're at the forefront here. So how was the reception to that? What, what did you you know, did you get feedback you didn't expect? I'm sure you did. But, you know, how people who weren't expecting um, to have this type of analysis from a parent's mm -hmm. perspective on video games. Mm -hmm. What was that like for you? Yeah, I mean, it's been an uphill journey. I will say too, when I started my PhD, I, I went to a very traditional psychology program that does a lot of you know, cognitive learning and, and that sort of thing. And it was an uphill battle there to even <laughs> justify the need to study games. Um, and I remember even in my interview, I was saying like this and that and this and that. And they were like, why is it important? And I was like, well, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> but I said, you know, so we can inform parents, so we can inform clinicians because they have these questions and we don't have the answers. And they were like, oh, that's a good point. Um, so I think originally it's just kind of 
a surprise of, oh, do we need this information? Oh yeah, we would, we would like to have this information. And when I wrote a parent's guide, it was actually based off of a book I published a couple of years earlier called The Video Game Debate, which is a, okay. a series of essays. So they're written by experts of the field um, relating to the popular debates around games. So there's one on aggression, there's one on sure. um, learning, there's one on social outcomes. And when I published that one, I was like, parents will love this. And then I became a parent and I thought, parents don't have time to read this. So they're, they're not gonna love this. So I condensed, I took like the most important practical bits and I wrote a parent's guide, um, which okay. is significantly shorter. And it's just kind of like the TLDR of like what you need. Yeah, to cliff notes. We used <laughs> yeah, to call exactly. them, Exactly, right? <laughs> exactly. And when I put that book together, I took all the topics from uh, the video game debate. And then I, I went to parents and I said, what do you want to know? Like, is there any questions that you have lingering? And the only different chapter in a parent's guide from video game debate is about uh, toxicity in gaming cultures. So that was a surprise to me. So parents, of course, you know, aggression, violence, addiction, they're interested in that. But there was a lot, they were they were aware enough of kind of the impression uh, that gaming culture has to say, well, I'm a little concerned about sure. my kids interacting in these spaces. So that was definitely surprising for me. Wow. Yeah, that's, uh, so that's crazy. Did you, it, let me ask you this, is there any kind of feedback or compliment or negativity that you received in response to that, that surprised you? Uh, in response to the book? Yeah. Um, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say I, it's been pretty well received from parents. Cause I think that parents want the information. Sure. Um, even when I go and I do events now that are relatively unrelated, I went to a, a dinner, a South by Southwest dinner that was just to talk about like the future of, of work. Like it wasn't even directly related to games. Sure. And there was like a line of people at the end. My child plays Fortnite. Um, can I talk to you about my child? <laughs> like, so they really, they do have the questions and I think they sure. just necessarily don't realize that like books like this are out there or people like me are out there to answer to answer these questions. Sure, yeah, it's just too new. It's not something everyone yeah. anyone's really thought of before. Yeah. Um, and and the way games are now, even compared to 20 years ago, right? You can spend so mm -hmm. much time on one game now, like Fortnite, you mentioned, or Roblox, yeah. or Minecraft, or all these popular ones, right? It's just very different. Um, very. So, and then I also saw that you uh, did a Kickstarter program uh, for did. the Pragmatic Princess. I uh, did. <laughs> so oh, 26, my passion. Yeah, so yeah. 26 superb stories of self-sufficiency. Um, yeah. You successfully kickstarted that, and I saw it was a couple years ago now. But I, mm -hmm. again, I just found that really interesting. Uh, I found the old listing for it uh, from a book perspective, and then if I'm again, keep me honest here. But just recently now, uh, you had the latest story on that, which is stories from Cloud Canyon. Yes, okay. yes. So I, I, I had this idea. My daughter really loves reading. Okay. And That's good. I got a. a it is good. Uh, she, at the time, she was four. Oh, she loved like being reading me reading stories to her um <laughs> and i had gotten a whole bunch of books from like a garage sale so i had like tons and tons of books and so every night i was reading her a different one and i was getting really annoyed that the female <laughs> characters um first of all there weren't many second they always seemed to need some kind of companion to help them save the day or third <laughs> they had superpowers and i was like where's like the everyday girl just doing cool right. stuff um, and so I contacted my friend Lizzie in the UK who runs kind of a micro uh, press. And I was like, you should find someone to write these stories about everyday girls. And she was like, well, why don't you write them? I was like, I can't write them. That's I'm, I'm sorry, I write science books. That's not my jam. She was like, just try. Um, and I wrote these 26 stories in a very a shockingly short amount of time. So I That's guess cool. the stories were inside of me. Um, <laughs> So yeah, so it's 26 stories, A to Z. So it's like Ada the Adventurous and Bella the Brave. And, and each story okay. is just an everyday girl solving an everyday problem with her everyday abilities. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, and then that then spun off to stories from Cloud Canyon, which I intend to be like topical stories using the same characters from the same universe. So the first one is Invisible Friends and it uses characters from Pragmatic Princess talking about internet stranger danger. Oh, so it's okay. like the it's like modern Berenstein Bears is how I like it. <laughs> I love the Berenstein Bears when I was a kid. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so again, that's that's really neat, and I it's I've supported a few Kickstarters, but it's got to be kind of cool to see a project that you put together, you know, yourself and wrote, kind of come to life through that that program. Yeah, surreal. It was, it I was, bet. 
Very surreal. There's a reaction video of me somewhere when it got funded. Just very, very surreal and very nerve wracking. Kickstarters are not for the faint of heart. My gosh, they're a lot of work and they're really You're probably checking like it like day. 20 times a day, aren't oh, they? Oh, just constant refresh. Yeah. I can imagine. Um, and then finally, the other thing I wanted to com comment on is uh, outside of Take This, you also run a separate uh, channel yourself, if I'm correct, called Psychegeist. Yes. Uh, which is basically the science around video games. Um, yes. And some of the things I noticed was it's not just uh, mental health per se, it's really the scientific kind of design behind certain games. Is that right? That is correct. So um, Psychegeist grew out of my need to have a hobby during COVID quarantine. We all picked okay. up a hobby, that was, sure. that was mine. Um, but it also, again, plays back to this idea of getting information, scientific information out in a way that's understandable and relatable for parents, for educators, for policymakers, for people looking to come into the field, for gamers who are just interested in, in learning a bit more about why they like the games they like or whether or not uh, games make you violent or what's game addiction and whatnot. Um, yeah. So it grew out of that and I, I actually, I really love it. I think that YouTube is, is made for me because I can make these videos and edit them and not have the ums and I can, <laughs> I'm getting better at like green screening things and yeah, okay. it's a whole lot of fun and I really enjoy it. Yeah. The avenue of it, um, the freedom and just kind of, yeah. like you said, and being able to do that is really neat. Um, and obviously, you know, especially for someone who runs a channel and content creation and stuff, um, that's exploded in the past year. You know, you're one of millions and millions of people that have found kind of that avenue while being yeah. stuck at home. So yes, yes, for sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So uh, I wanted to cover all that because I, again, for the audience, it just, I think it demonstrates um, just how kind of broad and expansive uh, your work is kind of in this area. So um, yeah, really neat. So uh, we kind of talked about what got you in the games to begin with, um, but now let's talk about um, kind of as you're doing this work, right? Whether it be for Take This or some of your personal conversations or you know things that you do online, um, what do you feel are kind of some of the biggest uh, you know, negative associations that people have with games in general. I mean, we we probably know the common ones that get talked about pretty regularly, right? To give video games make my children violent, uh, you know, all the all the regular ones. Um, but is yeah. there is there anything that you feel yourself having to combat uh, just on a regular basis? All of them. All of it. Yeah. Shockingly, still the aggression and violence one, even though of, of all the areas and all of game studies that has the most funding, the most science, the most very much disputed, still almost always the first question is about violence or aggression. It's sad, isn't it? <laughs> it's so frustrating. <laughs> I can imagine. So frustrating. I can imagine. It's funny because with Psych Guys, I just shot that video and it's going to go out in August about the, the research relating to violence and aggression. And I had avoided it for almost a year because I started last August because I'm so sick and tired of talking about it. Yeah. It's all anybody, you know, like not with you, but I mean like that, why is that the only one like yeah. always at the top? And it's like, there's, there's no link. There's no link. <laughs> Yeah, I've I've done a few. Uh, so um, not to turn on a negative spin, but if you weren't aware, mm -hmm. I, I lost my second youngest son three years ago, um, and dealing with that type of loss um, is really what made me start diving into this stuff uh, because mm -hmm. video games have played a huge part in my life, my whole life. Um, but after experiencing something like that, I kind of felt they they became something different to me. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And, escapism and all the other things that that come up yeah. there but it made me start doing more research and so i've written a number of articles where i dive into articles from people like yourself you know mm -hmm. and kind of just you know the research studies and stuff and and you're right i mean no matter what kind of angle i take or research i do on video games and mental health and all these things it always ends up with the, the violence thing it's just always right there and right there it, it, and, and there's so much information it on it like you said i mean it takes all of yeah. five seconds to find scientific <laughs> articles disproving any link um, yes, it's, it's got to be that's what's, that's what's so frustrating about it. Um, <laughs> but for I want to say sorry for your loss. I don't want to oh, like gloss over fine. that. Thank um, you. That's you know parents, parents, children. Um, yes. But you bring up a very good point about games as tools for positivity, games as mechanisms to help foster and bolster mental health versus you know games, uh, aggression, addiction, 
uh, social in inadequacy, um, all the ones yeah. that usually rise to the top. Yes, yes. So uh, as I just kind of commented, right, and one of the things I've studied a little more lately is around using video games for escapism. And mm -hmm. I believe, correct, again, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I think I saw you post about an article that came out recently or semi-recently about uh, New York Times. I don't know, a big publication basically published some article about uh, yes. negative New connotations. Times. Yeah, exactly. Yes. And so I, I saw you comment on that. And, uh, you know, what, what are your thoughts or what has your research kind of taken you to in that realm? And we'll talk about some individual things, but mm -hmm. in that realm of like, uh, you know, using video games for escapism or mm -hmm. in that vein. Games are tools, are always kind of the framework I like to work from. And it's funny because I I ended up doing a video on escapism specifically for Sightgeist because it seems that escapism in relation to games is always seen as something bad. Mm -hmm. uh, my child is escaping into, um, you know, the world of Azeroth and it's not it's dealing with bad. his own problems in the real world. Right, real world. Right. He's avoiding things. He's, yeah. uh, he has virtual friends. Okay, fine. But you know, I binge watch the Witcher and that's fine. Oh, my wife is escaping with Henry Cavill or whatever it is. Um, <laughs> but that's not seen as negative or a book, right? I have lots of books, lots of books that I like reading. And if yeah. I spend four hours reading a book at night, Oh, good. Oh, good. Good yeah. for her. Yeah. Good thing but if you I read, spend, yeah. Yeah, if I spent four hours in World of Warcraft, ooh, <laughs> something's wrong with her. Um, but you know, it's a tool. Escapism is not inherently a bad thing. We all need it um, as for stress release and mood management, and all that stuff. Yeah. And games are great for it. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, obviously, you know, I completely agree. And I always do find the kind of hypocrisy in the statements around uh, yes. how video games are used versus TV and movies and books yes. and music Absolutely. and everything that yeah. people have used for generations over and over, right? Um, exactly. And, yeah. you know, when they were popular, that was a problem too, right? Rock and roll problem, true. movies problem. So we're just, yeah. we're just the latest in the cycle. You know? <laughs> see how long it takes to get past it. We'll see. Yeah. When VR <laughs> becomes cheaper then, then, oh, VR is the problem. Not, yeah. Yeah. yeah so, you know, probably. tell us that it's going to be like, uh, what's the movie, you know, Ready Player One, where everyone just kind of yeah, lives yeah. in the secondary world. <laughs> yep. Um, <laughs> uh, so, one of the other things that uh, is a very big topic, and uh, I have a, a friend of mine who's uh, a woman who writes for our site, um, and she wrote an article last year by speaking to quite a few content creators out there, uh, all women, about toxicity towards mm -hmm. women and, and g gaming content creation. Obviously, it spans well beyond that, but specifically, sure. specifically for this conversation. Um, and... Uh, you know, I just feel that's a, a very important topic. And in fact, um, how I found Take This was uh, I was speaking to Black Compat, who was on one oh, of your panels. Yes. Months yes. Ago. And I actually have that video on our Good and Gaming um, page on our site uh, as awesome. a reference. And so, you know, watching that panel, reading through the articles and, and speaking to Angela and, um, you know, uh, obviously many other people among the community, it's, it's something that it's hard for someone like me to understand, not understand obviously all the negatives and, and the reality of it, mm -hmm. right? But understand where uh, guys come from or people come from mm -hmm. in that area because it's just so foreign to me. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it's it's a real, real problem. And, yeah, you know, I, I just, I don't know. I don't know where I'm going with a question here, but I guess my question would be, you know, from your perspective, obviously it's something you've talked about you know, it's a big topic in gaming right now in the gaming community, uh, esports even too. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, what are your thoughts around that? You know, what what causes that or what's, uh, you know, what can people do about it? I just any open thoughts around that entire yeah. kind of huge topic. It is so. a big topic. <laughs> um, it's the area that I'm getting into recently, though. Um, okay. That's kind of where my, my area of research is focusing. So I'm, I'm okay. happy to talk about it. But it is... Uh, a big open question. Where does it come from? There's a lot of theories. People have linked it to certain personality traits um, for the people who are more likely to be perpetuators of this behavior. Um, there's something to be said about gamer culture kind of accepting this behavior. Um, you know, like the parents said, like they already know that there's this idea that it's toxic and that's just the way it is. And if you're going to be part of it, 
of the community. You're going to have to learn to deal with it. Uh, there's the idea that it's a boy's toy. We talked about this earlier where it's yeah. like the, the girl watches the, the boy. I watch my brother play. And when girls encroach on this space, it's like you're encroaching on like a, a guy's space and, and the resistance comes from there. Right. So it's not exactly totally sure. There's a lot of pieces to put in the puzzle there. And it could um, really be all of the above, right? Oh, Depending it most on, yeah. likely is. Yeah. Most likely is all of the above. I will say it is a big, big problem. I just um, presented along with Christy Cook from the New Jersey Institute of Technology. We did a paper at this year's um, International Communication Association Conference. And we looked at the prevalence of different kinds of toxicity. Because my kind of baseline question was like, is it like 98% trash talking and like half a percentage like doxing? Like what's the, what are we talking about? Like how severe is the problem? And we found that 8% of people reported being doxed in some way. 8% wow. is so high yeah. to me. I was, I was shocked. It's kind of um, scary, right? I mean, it's terrifying. Yeah. I mean, I just signed up for TikTok. Okay. I'm already <laughs> I saw your getting video hate. yesterday, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm already getting, not like hate, I wouldn't say. Hate's a strong word. I'm getting yeah. comments that are concerning that are indicative of this kind of behavior that we're talking about. So, I mean, it's prevalent. It's there. It's everywhere on the internet. Um, games specifically, how do we combat it? I think it, it takes cooperation from the industry and people outside the industry to come up with strategies and you know games for change is doing some great stuff there's a raising good gamers initiative that's doing some great stuff so i'm optimistic that that wheels are turning now um but we're not there yet yeah yeah i can i can imagine it's it's one of those issues that um there's no kind of golden arrow to solve it right it, it's yeah it's got to be attacked from many many different people and areas and angles um for sure and, and that's uh you know one of the things I like talking about, I actually talked to Stephen Spawn from, um, mm. uh, or Spawn, excuse me, from you know uh, Able Gamers a few weeks ago. We were talking about you know for this initiative as well about disabilities and you know accessibility and all those things. And you know one of the questions I asked Tim, which I kind of posed to you as well, is really around, you know, I feel uh, kind of a responsibility for being uh, a media publication in the gaming space mm -hmm. to talk about these things. Uh, mm -hmm. to shine a spotlight on them. That's what the whole initiative's about, right? Is trying Definitely. to shine a spotlight. And um, I, I don't know about you, because I'm sure you kind of look at this through a different, or a, 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 certainly a, a different lens than I do. You know, you're probably seeing it in a different way than I do. But when I look across kind of the, the major publications, obviously we're not a major publication, but it, it feels like um, there's not enough focus on it. It's too little, uh, not enough people talk about it or really kind of tackle this from a serious manner. Um, you know, and I, I, I don't know your thoughts as you look across, you know, all you see on YouTube or you see on mm -hmm. social media and Twitter and the gaming community. Um, you know, do you feel there's kind of a lack of, um, man, sorry, my brain today, a lack of, uh, you know, a lack of focus, I guess you could say from some of the larger outlets and, and people on, on, you know, talking about these things openly. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, yeah. Thinking back at like what I've seen in terms of, of getting a lot of kind of focus on it, the Anti-Defamation League is doing some fantastic work. Uh, and that is spurning some change and some discussions and raising good gamers initiative, as I mentioned before, um, from the Fair Play Alliance yeah. um, is is bringing attention, more attention. And there was one really good Wired piece like six months <laughs> okay. ago. But other than that, <laughs> there, was, there was one. <laughs> there was one. Other than that, there's not much I can think of because you have front page of the New York Times you know, printing, you know, just antiquated stereotypical game yeah. stuff. And that tends to be, you know, where the media's mind is when it comes to covering things in games instead of things like this. Yeah. And it's, you know, it feels, and I, I kind of rant about this all the time, but it pe feels purposely flammatory, right? Um, they, yeah. they know what's going to get the attention. They're just yeah. doing it. To get the hits and it's, it's frustrating. It's, yeah. And it's, it's hard to combat to that point because you know that as soon as they publish that, it's got millions and millions of eyes on it. Whereas, you know, this uh, research paper that may be published on a few outlets has hundreds of eyes. I don't have millions of eyes on my work. <laughs> I mean, I did rant pretty hard about that New York Times article and I got maybe thousands of eyes, which is which is good. But yeah, yeah it, it's, it's frustrating. And when I found out that that was printed on the front page of the New York Times, I was even more just like mind boggled. Yeah. Yeah, it definitely seems like it came from an era that should be behind us at this point. Yeah, um, right. You know, I, 
Yeah, I mean, I grew up, I, you know, I grew up in arcades, and I, I literally played Mortal Kombat and Street Fighter competitively. I played tournaments. Mm -hmm. Oh, cool. Um, and the Mortal Kombat, as you remember, in the '90s, was you know oh. we had Congress talking about oh. Mortal Kombat. Yeah. Yes. Um, and it's just it's it's just it's almost comical to me um, how people make these connections. You know, when I look at all the people I grew up with and stuff, it's it's bizarre. Um, <clears throat> but I mean, especially now that we know that it's not there, so at least right. I give them some leeway. Back in the '90s, they didn't know. That's now true. we very much know. <laughs> that <there's nothing. laughs> that's fair. That's fair. Yeah, I don't want to give them too much leeway, but that's still yeah, fair. Yeah, a little. Bit. <laughs> um, so when you look across, you know, we've kind of talked about escapism. We've touched on that. Um, obviously, you know, these are gigantic topics that, you know, we could talk about for hours on end. But sure. when you look uh, across um, the mental health aspect of gaming, what kind of really stands out to you that you and your peers may be discovering in terms of benefits? Um, one of the things, uh, one of the articles that has been viewed the most by me that I wrote was after my son passed, I wrote an article called The Good in Gaming. Um, really about, uh, we always focus on the negatives or, you know, a lot of media focus on the negatives. We need to focus mm -hmm. on the positives. And what mm -hmm. I highlighted was charitable causes, you know, the extra life, sable gamers, all those, mm -hmm. uh, the benefits escapism we already touched on, uh, you know, the charity work in hospitals and, uh, yes. helping people with disabilities, you know, all of these things. Right. So I think there, there's an awful lot there that we can, um, spotlight from a positive perspective, which is what I prefer to do. So you and your peers, as you, you know, kind of think across the spectrum, um, yeah. what, what's more recent, um, more recently surprising you guys around some of the uh, positive benefits that you're finding from gaming? Well, for me, it's always about uh, the social benefits. I guess, I guess that goes back to kind of my PhD work and my, and my postdoc work. And recently there's been an uptick in discussion about how even one player games are social because we form these social relationships with the characters that we play the okay. games with. Uh, we call them parasocial relationships, but they have very tangible social benefits to them. Like we know they're not like real. We know our animal crossing neighbors aren't real, but the sense of camaraderie or the reduction in a sense of loneliness uh, and the emotional connections are very much real. And that's been fantastic during COVID quarantine when people can't see their friends and, and aren't necessarily playing together. So that's been kind of a big kind of aha moment for me in the last maybe six, eight uh -huh. months is, is thinking about games as social, even when you're not necessarily playing immediately with somebody next to you. Um, and also I think getting back to basics, games are playful and play is great <laughs> for all ages. Like people think that, you know, only kids should play, adults need to play too. And, sure. it's, and it's really good for your mental health and stress release and it's associated with the release of endorphins and, you know, we should all be playing more. Wow. Oh, I'm not gonna argue with you there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but the, the parasocial thing is very interesting. I, I haven't mm -hmm. read anything in that regard yet, but um, you know, as oh, you were- wait. Let me tell you, Please. let me tell you a story. Please. There's this great research study since since now I know you haven't heard of it. I always talk about this research study when okay. I talk about parasocial relationships because it's my I did it's not mine, but it's my favorite work of like the last ten years. Um, have you seen Game of Thrones? Yes. Have you seen all of the Game of Thrones? Is yes. Okay. Spoiler: If those listening have not, yeah. right, some spoilers are coming. Um, so there was a research study by uh, Daniel and Westerman, and they looked at. Twitter responses and the sentiments that were expressed on Twitter after Jon Snow died. Okay. And what they found is it could map exactly in the same ways that we um, grieve and express grief for people that we know and love. So like the seven stages of grief, sure. like anger, bargaining, whatever. Yeah. It's, it was the same. Jon Snow yeah. is not real, right? But if you were, I was very upset um, <laughs> when Jon Snow died. Uh, but it goes to show these relationships, they're parasocial, they're one way. We are putting our emotions on this character. You know, Kit yes. Harrington doesn't know who I am, Jon Snow isn't real. Um, and the same can be said about, you know, how we feel when our, our characters in Final Fantasy die or, you know, whatever, our, how we feel when we see our favorite neighbor at Animal Crossing. Yeah, I was gonna say for me, favorite. Last of Us 2 was that way. Um, right. No, spo again, spoilers, but uh, yeah, yeah I, uh, that game got under my collar. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> for that reason. Yes. Yeah. You're connected. Uh, wow, that's really cool. Uh, you'll have to, you can DM me because I, I would like to read that actually. So it's um, great. I will. 
Okay. Doing, so. Yeah. I'll, I'll definitely check that out. But no, that's interesting because as you, it's funny you make that connection and brought that up because as you were saying that, my mind started thinking about characters that I know and love and kind of associate with. And, and there is, right. And, and, and I don't think that's any different. Again, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, it would, the, parallels there to uh, other things we know and love, like books, right? When you're reading a book and you're invested over weeks of reading a book and a character you come to, you know, imagine and interpret mm -hmm. uh, and some a tragedy happens that takes them away, you, I would ex assume it's the same type of experience, right? Yes, exactly. Yes. And, and actually the term parasocial relationship was coined to refer how people feel towards their favorite newscasters. Uh, which is funny, you know, we all have a favorite news channel, um, <laughs> but it's since been expanded. So yeah, exactly. To explain just the one way emotional sentiments that we, that we connect, we have these connections with yeah. You know, yeah. Frodo and, and Jon Snow and, you know. And really anyone. Yeah. I mean, I, people yeah. know me and I'm sure somewhere behind me there's something, but you know, I'm a Halo fanatic and one of the ongoing oh, jokes in the Halo community is, Master Chief's going to die at some point. And, you know, yeah, immediately, see? it's like the thought of it is like, that can't happen, you know? Like, well, exactly, no. exactly. <laughs> Certainly not real. Um, yeah, that's that's really cool. So thank you for sharing that. No um, so anything else kind of on the broad spectrum of what we're talking about here that you feel is, is kind of, this is a loaded question, I realize. I was going to say noteworthy, and I'm sure there's a million things. But, you know, <laughs> anything else that you want to kind of comment at while we're on that topic of just mental health uh, aspects of video games? Yeah, I think it's important to, I want to point out the uniqueness of games. So a lot of times sure. I talk about social connections on games and people are like, yeah, you know, but social media, you have social connections too. And What's inherently different about games is that they are these playful spaces and they allow us to connect by having shared experiences. And even if I'm not, if I, I don't play Halo and I'm an Xbox, but if I played Halo and you love Halo, we could also connect over those shared experiences, even yeah. though they were experienced separately. Um, so it really does provide like cultural capital uh, for generations um, of people to engage and interact with and, and have these, these shared experiences. And, and it's, magic it's magic to be honest i mean video games are a billion dollar industry everybody's playing them and they give us the opportunity to have these shared stories and these shared experiences um in a playful accessible <laughs> space so they shouldn't be discounted it, it reminds me my neighbor i have a wonderful neighbor who i love and adore and i always bring her up and i'm sorry you know i love you neighbor um <laughs> but she has a 12 year old son and she's always coming to me very concerned especially of last year He's playing too many video games. Sure. He's home too much. School is, you know, he's in quarantine. He's playing too many video games. And I'm like, what is he playing? And she's like, Minecraft. And I'm like, <laughs> that is the best possible thing your yeah. son could be doing right now. Right. Um, oh, and he's playing with his friends. That's excellent. Yeah. Um, so it's just about getting the information out there that, of course, screen should not be everything that you do. Of, of course, course yeah. video games should not be the only thing that you do. There's, you know, eye strain and posture and sedentary lifestyle and lots of concerns, yeah. but... Um, there's a lot of good to be had, yeah. Minecraft especially. especially. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, I used to joke my son's growing. I mean, that it, Minecraft was so big in our house, uh, and it was played so often that I actually had to tell him I bought him headsets because I was so tired of hearing the song from the world. Oh, it that's was just so funny. <laughs> 24 hours a day, every day. Yeah. And after a while, I was like, I can't hear it anymore. It's just too much. Yeah. My six-year-old <laughs> loves Minecraft. She plays, we got a little private server with her neighborhood friends. Minecraft that's is awesome. fantastic. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, you know, and it's used in educational purposes. Um, yes. In fact, uh, four or five years ago, I bought my son the Minecraft uh, edition where you can code. And it started to teach him how to code. He designed his cool. own armor set and all that stuff. And you know, it's that's fantastic. so cool. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I think, you know, as you commented there and video games being as big as they are and the experiences they now offer, right. And that's mm -hmm. only growing. I think that's, what's so yeah. interesting to me is that when you look at the experiences you can have through gaming now versus even 10 years ago, especially yeah. 20, 30 years ago, um, it, it's night and day and, and the industry, you know, that, that it's just going to continue to expound, right? So I think the possibilities there for how we experience things um, is very, you know, it's just... Exponential. It's yeah, exactly. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I mean, we haven't even talked about Twitch. 
No, watching other people play video games. <laughs> yes. I mean, that has been that has also exploded over the last year. Yes, the amount of people has. who are streaming, the amount of people who are watching. Uh, and there was a research paper published just a couple months ago uh, by Jan de Witt. Oh, I don't remember where he is. I think he's in Belgium uh, and his colleagues looking at Twitch during difficult periods of, of your life. And even right. just having Twitch on in the background, even if you're just lurking, has significant impact on on lower rates of depression and lower rates of anxiety and lower rates of wow. loneliness. Um, and that, they, I'm sorry. Hmm? Go ahead. Please finish. I was going to say they were. They say they hypothesized that it being around video games was significant. It wasn't just about having somebody live, although that was that was part of it. But it was about having the shared experience of games. That's exactly what I was just going to ask you because yeah. um, no joke. Uh, Last year, uh, there's a popular uh, World of Tanks streamer I follow. Um, and last year, when we first came home, I found myself working here at my desk, but I would kind of have him up, you know, all the mm -hmm. time because he plays, he, that's what he does for his, you know, he's huge. Um, but what I found is exactly that. I was going to ask you, you were just talking about the benefits of shared experience. And yeah. it just feels like even if you're not really paying attention to every detail that's happening in the game, it feels like there's a community you're joined with, mm -hmm. you know, right Absolutely. there that's live, right? And that you're there, yeah. even if you're not really there. Absolutely. I, I was watching a lot of gamer doc at the beginning of the of the um, pandemic and she was doing O Serena of Time that's and she never played it before. And okay. she was in the water temple and she could not <laughs> master wall jumps like for anything. Sorry, gamer doc, it's true. Um, <laughs> and when you finally got like, figured out how to do wall jumps, even though I was only halfway paying attention, it was like this moment of like, we were all cheering for her and yeah. we were all so excited and um, it's silly. Yeah, no, but yeah, it is a very similar experience with uh, who I watch. And, and the other thing that's really neat about that too is uh, you actually, depending on the game, of course, you can learn, right? I mean, the, the reason yeah. people watch pro players or, you know, these competitive games or whatever it may be for me, World of Tanks is it's such an in-depth game and I don't have the time to play it like someone like yeah. he does, right? So uh, he'll explain all the mechanics and details and stuff. So you're learning even while you're not mm -hmm. playing the game or don't have time to play the game, which is yeah, and of course, and you're experiencing things that you wouldn't get to experience, and you get to do it vicariously. So I watch yeah. um, Dat Mods is another one I, I watch a lot. I watched before even Twitch was bought when Twitch had like five streamers. I would watch him, uh, <laughs> and he would play Diablo three. Which oh, I love, yes. but I had just had my my first child and I wasn't and I wasn't able to play. But it would allow me to see like the new content and I what's happening in the game and oh look at his you know his gear is like very nice compared to the gear that I have and <laughs> um, yeah so it's not even it's about being a community it's about fun but it's also about like hey what's happening in this game that I know I have no time to play <laughs> <laughs> right right yeah yeah so it's funny because you know we talked about questions that people who aren't kind of in the space and, and don't have any knowledge of it that ask about mm -hmm. video games or hear about video games. Mm -hmm. And funny enough, I swear I had a conversation with one of my uh, leadership in uh, it, my, my actual career. Um, <laughs> and his son, uh, his son plays games, you know, like obviously most teenagers do now. And one of the things he asked, he says, he watches people play video games. He was very confused by it, you know, mm -hmm. watches. And I'm sure I don't have to tell you. Um, but I was like, yeah, I was like, it's, it's a big thing, you know. It's not something that's weird, or it's he's alone thing. in it. It's a it's a big thing. It's yeah. not a bad thing. And I talked to him for a good like ten minutes about it because he that's was awesome. just baffled. You know, he couldn't yeah comprehend that why you would watch someone else play a video. Game. <laughs> well, you know, Bill Maher had a rant on it. I know that we don't go to Bill Maher necessarily for the best hot takes, but he did have <laughs> um, he did have a rant a couple weeks ago about. I Twitch. remember. I remember. Yeah. Yes. And being like, what a waste of time. And mm -hmm. it's like, um, you know, not only are there like mental health benefits, it's mm -hmm. Twitch is, I don't know what they're valued at, but a lot, like a lot of money yes. um, goes through that organization. And I mean, even going back to our original discussion, how this interview started, I, some of my best memories from my childhood was sitting and watching my brother play Final Fantasy games because mm -hmm. they're one player games. I love Final Fantasy. It's my favorite franchise of all time. The okay. stories are amazing. And vicariously, not vicariously, I mean, I was there experiencing it with him next to him, yeah. even if I'm not playing. It's like the original Twitch is player two. I Little sister be... is the original. <laughs> <laughs> Littlesister.com. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, which is probably, a, I have no idea if that's a real site or No, what don't is. go there. I, that doesn't sound like something. No, that's not a promotion. <laughs> I may need yeah. to cut that. Um, <laughs> uh, 
what I was going to say is I, you know, it just, again, occurred to me while you're saying that. Yeah. It's, it's, it was never thought of in that way growing up. I mean, yeah. we as kids used to sit around mo more than just family, right? You'd have a friend would get a new game. Mm -hmm. Everyone would go to their house and there'd be six of you. Only one could play. So, right. you, you know, you right. would just sit there and just watch someone else play games. No one thought any exactly. different of it. No. You know? And now all of a sudden it's, it's weird and a waste of time. We've been doing it the whole time. <laughs> just now we can do it on the internet. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Um, I remembered the thing when you were talking about uh, kind of the, the, uh, the market of video games, the growing and, and the experiences mm -hmm. that are growing there. One of the things I I've talked about pretty frequently recently and just get your thoughts on is um, cultural learnings from video games. So, you know, mm -hmm. over the past kind of three decades, it's been really kind of Western Europe, Japan, North America, mm -hmm. video mm -hmm. game development, right? But yeah. we're, now that the market is <clears throat> really growing globally, you know, South Korea is a big player. China's really coming up now. And, uh, you know, there's other markets in South America and just kind of all over where developers are springing up. And I find what's really interesting about that is you're getting experiences from cultures that you may know nothing about. Um, you know, I mean, how much does the average American know about Chinese culture and history and, right. you know, beliefs and religions and all these things, right? And we know, it seems like we we feel we know so much about Japan because many of us grew up just idolizing mm -hmm. Japan and mm -hmm. Japanese yeah. culture and games and everything, right? Um, which is not a bad thing. But, you know, I think it's one of the things I get really excited about is the, the prospect of development from all these different areas and just seeing what they bring to light in this medium that you can interact with. Um, I think that's just, yeah. you know, really exciting. Definitely. It has the ability to <laughs> convey so much cultural information. I mean, I talk about it, I have talked about it in the past in relation to Final Fantasy specifically, um, about how it conveys important tenets of Japanese culture, yeah. just in the way that the game is made with the strong female characters, right? Female protagonists, way before anyone else was doing female protagonists <laughs> in role-playing games. Um, it integrates the tenets of Bushido very often in, in their main uh, characters, like in their personalities, the way that Cloud is, for instance. Um, there's lots of examples of his his inner struggle between like loyalty, duty, and honor, which are, which are sure. the three tenets. So it is really exciting, not only that it's expanding and we're going to be able to experience different cultures, but the expansion of indie games yeah. has been incredible yeah. over the last like five, six years. Yeah, it has. Um, it's, you know, as someone who runs an outlet and a lot of contacts with indie developers, it's almost mm -hmm. overwhelming. You know, I, I yes. get more emails and codes and stuff a day than I can even keep up with because there's yeah. just so many people trying to make their mark now. Um, mm -hmm. So I've got to ask you, um, mm -hmm. because you brought it up a few times now, Final Fantasy. Yes. And this is, yes. a, okay, I I'll caution you. Because this, <laughs> this is a Final big, words. this is a big yes. debate among uh, okay. a portion of the community that my yes. my group interacts with is mm. huge debate in the gaming community because there's so many Final Fantasy games, right? Yes. What, which is the best one? What's your favorite? Um, I will die on this hill. It is six. Six. Yes. Is the best. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, yes. That's getting yes. clipped and put on Twitter. By oh, the way. that's so. fine. I, I will happily <laughs> die on that hill. Six is the best for sure. For sure. It is absolutely the best. Um, yes. For. Oh, a number of reasons. Um, yes. The debate honestly usually comes down in our community between six and seven. Um, my, my husband is a seven. He is a very much a seven, I'm and seven sorry. can be second. Six is number one. <laughs> yes, yes, that's true. That's true. Okay, so, wait. But if six is number one and seven's number two, what is number three? Actually, see, I don't have seven number two. Oh, uh, okay. Give yeah. me your top three. Uh, top three is tough. Uh, I am a kid of the 16 bit era. So, yes. you know, in America, it was two and three, but it's four and six in reality. Yes. So, those two for me are just, they're, they're those my favorite. The top two. Um, I would say probably nine after that. See, nine is the only one I, I played it that yeah. I couldn't ever really just break it's, into it. It does seem divisive. Like, some people really love because it tried yeah. to bring back some of the older aspects. Um, and some people really attached to that. I know I did. And others are like, yeah, mm -hmm. I just couldn't. It didn't do it for me. I just the same couldn't. Way. Just didn't, I mean, I would have to put 10 as number three. I see that. I see that come up quite 10 a bit. Is good. Too. And 10 had the voice acting. I so clearly I was 18 when it came out. Whatever. Yeah. That's how old I am. I'm old. Um, <laughs> I remember so clearly being like, <laughs> the world has changed. There's voice acting in a Final <laughs> Fantasy. Right? Because yeah. oh, it was the first one for PS2. 
which had yes. the DVD and changed, you know, changed everything. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. So you have to say you're it's season gaming for a reason, you know. We're, okay. We're... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> very good. Very good. <laughs> That's great though. I'm definitely clipping that. I'll leave the part about seven out. You know, I don't want to yes, embarrass yes, your husband. Yes, no, have, yeah. <laughs> You're funny. Definitely clip it. Uh, that's cool though. Um, <laughs> so um, now, now I'm thinking about all the Final Fantasies. Um, so you know, with, with I, I was going to ask you kind of what's next for you because um, you know you've done an awful lot, but I'm sure you know I don't want to assume, of course, but I can only imagine that there's you probably feel like there's so much more you can do and accomplish. And um, it, I'm sure it's probably almost an endless feeling, right? But you've been at Take This for two years, you said now, about Take This, yes. about two years. Um, you know, what are you looking forward to? Do you have anything kind of projects or anything big you're working on now? Or what are you looking forward to doing over the next, you know, six, 12, 18 months? Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to getting my feet wet, so to say, in original research um, funded by Take This. So we're starting to expand our research program specifically. So I'm looking to do more into toxicity um, and its impact on mental health. And I'm also looking to do more about the radicalization of youth in online gaming spaces in particular, which oh. isn't a sexy subject. Nobody really wants to touch that subject, <laughs> but it's an important one because it it's fueling, it's fueled again by the same stuff we've seen everything else about games fueled by an assumption that it's true with a lack of research to support it. Mm -hmm. There was an assumption that games make you violent with no research and that just kind of stuck. And with radicalization, there's an assumption that games are spaces where youth are radicalized. We don't know if that's true or not at all because nobody has looked at it. Whether it's true is important, whether it's not true, also important. Sure. Um, so I'm, I'm really interested. I've, I've been talking with the ADL. We've been trying to get um, game companies on board to be um, interested in working together on this kind of work because you can't do it in isolation. You need the support of the industry. But it seems to be one of those things that people are afraid of, which I get it. I understand. You can't open the conversation with that, with that research <laughs> project necessarily. But it's really important. It's really important. So I would love to see that get off the ground in the next 12 to 18 months. Yeah, I, I, that's not something, you know, I've maybe heard once or twice, but it's not something I've mm -hmm. heard kind of really talked about much at all. But um, yeah. again, just kind of an underlying thing that people assume. And I've been to conferences where they just like say it and I'm like, wait, <laughs> we don't know if that's true or not. Like, you can't just throw that out there. Right. Um, so right. Yeah, we'll see. Fingers so crossed. let me ask you this, too, then, um, you know, as, from an organizational standpoint and take this uh, and you representing the gaming side of it. Do you guys um, is there anything you do for like specific major conferences? Right. Do you deal with the PAXs? Mm -hmm. Do you deal with the E3? We do. Okay. All right. Yes. Because now that one of the things, you know, my group hated, we had huge plans for E3 last year. Obviously, this got canceled <laughs> yeah. and, you know, we're looking forward to getting back to PAX and E3 and those things. Yes. So, um, yeah, that will be cool. So what do you, what yeah, do you guys like, typically do there? Just awareness? Uh, awareness. And um, our flagship program is called the AFK Room, uh, which is a quiet, uh, professionally staffed space in the conference hall. So you go to PAXs, the floor is chaos. Um, yes. And you want a place to just kind of take a deep breath and relax. And, and PAX gives us these spaces every year. And we staff them with um, licensed clinicians. It's not a place you go for therapy, but it's a place you can go for support. And we have coloring books. And it's quiet. And we have bean bags and... Um, that was really our, our flagship program. We have since moved out more into education and advocacy. We still, of course, will run the AFK room when um, these conferences return. Yeah. But that's probably what we're most well known for. Um, so we're, we're expanding now. And we have an online AFK room now that we started last year because of PAX sure. Online. And we will have it again this year because PAX is going to be hybrid. Um, so, yeah. That's you can cool. find us if, if I would love to see you at PAXs when they return. I think East 2022 will probably be my glorious return to PAX because um, <laughs> I'm not yet fully vaccinated. I'm in Canada and we have limited supply of vaccines at the moment. So I won't be ready for PAX West, but East yeah. for sure. Very cool. I didn't realize you were in Canada. Um, I, yeah. I missed that. <laughs> where, where in <laughs> well, Canada are you? I'm in Ottawa. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. yeah I mean, it's Coast. big. I people that write for my site and, you know, big part of the community, obviously in Canada. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. So cool. Well, Rachel, this has been um, an absolute pleasure. Honestly, uh, I want to thank you again for coming on. Um, I, I find all of this uh, just not only fascinating, uh, you know, personally, but just important. I think, like I said earlier, I think there's a responsibility that uh, anyone running an outlet or a channel should have to talk about these kind of things. 
um, and just, you know, to help spread that awareness. So I think the work you do is, is amazing. And um, I wish you, you know, nothing but the best on future endeavors and everything you guys are going to be taking on here in the future. Thank you so much. And thank you for having me. I love having these conversations. It's not as often that you get to focus on the positive aspects. <laughs> so it's been really nice to talk about it. Nice, nice. So I'll have to stay in touch um, because yeah, sure. I would love to talk to you again in the future as you know, more of the stuff develops that you kind of touched on. So um, yeah, I'll definitely be in touch. So Sounds great. <laughs> All right. So thanks again, <laughs> everyone. That was Industry Perspectives with Rachel Cohart, Research Director at TakeThis.org. You can find all of her information, including links to everything she's published, Sightgeist, and everything else in the description. Please check that out. Thank you, as always, for your support. Until next time.